Uh, so you can think of this as a, a way to think about open project work, which we do a lot of here, uh, a way to think about coming to agreements and consensus, which are, are usually a part of open project work, um, and then a way to think about groups working effectively together, moving towards their shared goals. Uh, maybe, feel free to like just rate, if I talk too fast, which sometimes I do when I'm nervous, uh, feel free to just like point at me, like really fiercely, and then I will get that as a signal. Um, so, here we go. Uh, first of three parts, commons-based peer production, which is a bit of a mouthful. Kind of started with this, um, this guy who was an academic who was looking at, uh, he was looking at Wikipedia, and he was like, this is weird. This is like, there's no money being made, there's no market forces that I can really see, uh, there's no hierarchy happening, um, but people are producing a thing, they're making a thing happen in the world. Um, and he was like, what the, what the heck is this? Um, so, uh, so he kind of approached this from an, from an academic lens. Um, and so he was like, didn't have a name for it yet, but he saw it in some other areas. He was like, it seems to be in software and tech things a lot. It's open source, it's a Linux, building Linux code. We didn't know what it was called. Um, but the properties, what he thought were the main, some of the big properties of what made this interesting. If you kind of strip away the technology and, and those things, he was like, hey, this is, people are building something where there's a lot of modularity. They're reusable pieces that fit together. Um, it's granular, they're all kind of small. They're not like giant pieces, they're small pieces. Um, and then there's a low cost of integration, usually because things are online and the internet and they're digital, so it was kind of easier to stick them together. Um, so he invented a term, as academics are wont to do, and he said, this is commons-based peer production, uh, also known as social production, well, maybe a little easier. Um, and he threw that into the top of the slide. And uh, so, so just as an example of how this, what this is, it's you, know, you have Wikipedia, which has it's all articles. Those are pretty small, and they just kind of snap together. There's, um, they it's split up into sections. Um, there's kind of an easy QA process. Maybe easy, not easy, if you know Wikipedia well. Um, but so yeah, it's low cost to stick it all together. Um, but a book, which does not kind of like, they don't, you don't see those assembled really through this common based peer production approach. It's chapters, they're small maybe, that's interesting. Words and paragraphs um, are part of it. But the complex narrative, like the big the story is not thing that's easy to integrate, and so that we don't see, we don't see these sorts of interesting effects arise in, in book writing, like we do in Wikipedia, and building of encyclopedias. Um, so uh, after this had been worked on for a few, a few years and some books published, there's a really interesting approach that makes this whole thing feel very relevant to like the sort of work we do adjacent to government. Um, and uh, Helen Nissenbaum and Johai Bankler, the, the man who uh, originally kind of pulled this together, uh, wrote a paper about commons-based peer production and virtue, and basically he, he they tied, um, they basically said that uh, this is a model of production that avoids traditional price mechanisms, blah, blah, the things I said earlier. That's more than the mechanical cooperation. It requires self-discipline and like there's an appeal to the common enterprise. That's really, really common. Um, and then they kind of made this, this argument that the way these communities work they're not just places where you go when you're feeling and wanting to work virtuously, they actually tra are training grounds for cultivating virtue. And um, they kind of tried to lay an, lay an argument for that. Um, and so this, like, they, they said this bears on public policy in the same way that, like, we have, we make decrees in government about, like, you know, tax, perhaps, like, uh, tax-deductible donations to nonprofits should be something that we do because we want to affect the behavior and create virtue it, among among citizens, um, maybe maybe there's this is a, a rationale to incentivize commons-based peer production, the sort of open project work um, that maybe we do in this community. And is there is there a role for policy to kind of um, to to, uh, uh, to to bend towards this incentivizing it? Um, so this is the one I'm going to skip through. The other one is uh, kind of how we come to agreement together. Um, but I'm worried about time, so that was another piece of this the framework model of. Looking at the community, um, and the, the the other part, which is the probably the more interesting, most interesting chunk, is a social physics component of this research framework. This way of looking at communities and how they work and how they are the same and different. Um, so social physics is kind of a, it's a right, this a thing that started at a research lab at MIT, um, and it's kind of a mathy, uh, network-based way of looking at communities. Um, which is just one line, it's definitely never a whole picture, but um, they basically 
a lot of data and information that kind of draw a pretty compelling point to say that uh, we should think of uh, groups of people, communities, as like organisms for finding the best ideas within the community. Um, he, he uses machines, but I feel like my biology background says organisms is a better one. And we can think of networks of people as, as actually kind of networks of like all the good and bad ideas that are inside their heads, a bunch of like islands of ideas and concepts um, to address any, any challenge. Um, that the group may face. Uh, so one of the studies that the pieces that they did to understand this better um, was they uh, they looked to study something where the goal that everyone was sharing was kind of obvious, maybe to be healthier. It was a you know they could have studied something more complicated, but they thought this was pretty simple. Um, and they basically had a control group that they uh, basically gave them an app and said, hey, we're going to give you some money anytime you meet your day's fitness goal whenever you're healthier. Um, and they assumed, you know, people want to be healthy better. Um, and then they had an experimental group where they said, uh, we're gonna think of you as the group that you are, so we're gonna pair people up, people who know each other, and uh, with a friend, they would say, uh, whenever your friend meets their fitness goals, this app is gonna pay me money, um, a little bit of incentive. And whenever my friend meets their fitness goals, they're gonna, they're gonna uh, pay, uh, whenever the friend meets the fitness goals, they will pay me whenever I meet my fitness goals, my friend gets paid. Um, so there's a reciprocal thing, and they give no other instructions, nothing else. Um, but what they find is that, um, is that they, they call this, you can incentivize the person in isolation, and you can incentivize the social fabric, the space between people, a little microculture that's, that's always there in between, in between people. Um, and uh, what, they, what they found was that there was like 20 times more bang for buck in any incentive. For them it was money, but it could have been just like, Pats on the back, it can be fuzzier things. Um, but they found that incentivizing the social fabric is way, way more valuable than ever incentivizing the individual, like as if they are a unit, as if the individual is the important thing, um, which we often were tricked into doing. Um, but what they, they say the data argues for is always thinking about incentives on the space between people and not on people. Um, and this is because they, they conjectured that uh, when you put money on an individual, you're kind of dragging them out of a social context. You're getting them to change on their own, away from all the habits and, and things they're embedded in. But then when you apply the incentive to a relationship between two people, they start building a little bit of culture there. Maybe, you know, I realize my friend didn't, didn't exercise for five days in a row, but I don't call them up and I don't say, hey, give me my dollar, 40 cents a day, you weren't exercising. I, I'm just looking, I'm kind of watching this a little more closely because it's where the incentive is. And like, maybe I'm just, I call them up and I'm like, hey, what's up? Like, do you wanna do, you know, go to go to the gym or do whatever we're doing? And then maybe I find out something else, like their dog just passed away and that's why they weren't going. But, but by, by putting the incentive on the social fabric, it allows the human relationship to kind of like be the motivator. Like, we are actually closer for having had that little like incentive applied to the social fabric between us. Um, so, and they also do a few studies that are a little interesting where they, they make people wear these little badges. And the badge has a microphone that points up. And this is, uh, and, uh, and it knows when, when each wearer is talking. And then it has a little Bluetooth that knows how close it is to every other person who is in the study. Um, and so they would study events, they would study organizations, they would study uh, social gatherings, and they would know kind of the shape of the interaction in the room. They would know who spoke up, when they spoke up, they, won't, they didn't know what they talked about. And that was really an interesting part. They don't care the content of what's being said. They just want to know when is information being moving and who's there kind of thing. Um, so they, they care about the shape of the network, the relations between all the participants, not the messages that they, that they share. Um, this is kind of counter to a lot of ways we think about policy. We're like, well, things aren't going how we want them to be. So we'll, we'll, maybe everyone needs more information. Some training or some education, um, but they're, what they've what they found in a lot of this is that it's just the shape of the network that 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 is like not just, but it's a whole lot of the variation is in the shape um, and creating healthy shapes <laughs> of of communities and um, and so uh, they kind of boiled it down to two things: um, in, like between how people talk within their groups and how the groups how information moves. Between communicate. Um, so within groups, they find like overwhelmingly short bursts of communication, 
shared equally. So if you imagine like the conversation is a thing you're all building together, um, they kind of found that like, hey, the, the groups that meet their shared goals best um, by a few different measures depending on the context, they're ones who all built this together collaboratively. And one person didn't dominate, one person wasn't speaking a lot, um, short bursts of information being shared by each person, wearing these little badges, um, and everyone sharing equally. Um, and yeah, so they, they found that in many different contexts. Uh, so that's between groups, that's the way that ideas get socialized in groups, and those groups end up being um, more effective at meeting their, their shared goals. And how people arrive at shared goals, that's totally different. That's a whole different, this is the assumption that shared goals exist for a group. <laughs> um, so within groups, that's, that's kind of the dynamic they saw. But between groups, they found we almost uh, think of ourselves as like honeybees for ideas. Um, and so groups that found ways, whatever they were, of essentially foraging for various ideas and diverse sources of experience, diverse sources of expertise, those groups did a lot better. So they had, you can imagine like building a shared thing collaboratively within the group, but then there's also these flows of moving outside the group. Um, and some, sometimes when, when a group, they, they found that diverse experience is supported, or diverse, diversity of backgrounds of everyone and experiences of everyone, so this, this supports that because those people are more connected with, um, with communities that have ideas that perhaps wouldn't be found otherwise. Um, so the kind of interesting part is that they, they do kind of just brute force changing of the shapes of networks in their studies. Like they, they kind of callously just were like, hey, we're just gonna throw money at a lot of these things to try to, we're seeing a shape through this like hardware that we have. And we can see it and it's legible to us. Um, and we can just ch kind of add incentives to change the shape to what we, we know through our other studies lead to more effective groups. Um, and it's interesting how crude the incentives were that allowed them to do that. Um, uh, when they bend the groups to a, like a certain way of interacting, um, or allow the groups to bend themselves, interestingly. Sometimes they just show, they tell people, hey, we're gonna make this legible to you. Um, do with that what you will. These are the patterns that we think, that we have seen, lead to better group dynamics. Um, but we're not gonna reach in and change anything. We'll, we'll leave that to you. We'll just make it legible for you. And the same thing, the same things, uh, the same patterns were seen to be um, uh, led to groups meeting their shared goals better. Um, that's perhaps where that groups could change themselves when they had ways to make all this complicated information legible in very easy ways. That's perhaps the most interesting. Um, so yeah, this was uh, this was the framework from which kind of uh, I came in to like uh, was curious to like compare and contrast the community over there and the community here, um, and it, they they um, representatives from the community seemed um, they just seemed group. it gave them some I'm glad that it gave them some new things to chew on and they they uh, expressed gratitude for uh, for how this. You know, this, this framework. Um, so I just wanted to share. Uh, I, this is the tool of which I kind of like came to some results, and I could have just thrown all the results at everyone, um, but I thought it might be more interesting to share the framework. Hopefully, hopefully that, that makes sense. Um, so yeah, commons-based peer production, a way for thinking about open project work, a way for coming to agreement and consensus, which I had to skip through over that one, uh, and then uh, a ways for groups to work. Uh, yeah, that's that's it. Thanks. Any questions? Do you have a question? Question for Pascal? Also, challenges are totally welcome. And very. So there there seems to be a little bit of a contradiction with uh, everyone just sharing little bits of information. For example, you just gave a lecture, one to all uh, yeah. academia is, you write an article, you give a talk, you write a book, one to all, uh, that seems to be a dominant mechanism. Do you think that that's uh, a fault, or do you think it has to do with maybe these experiments <coughs> having tasks that didn't re require huge amounts of research and investment and report backs, or like, how do you kind of square that circle? <coughs> no, it's a, I struggle with that, I don't know if <laughs> but I, I mean, I, I feel like this mostly applies to collaborative spaces where, um, you know, there's, I, 
guess there's a thing, a thing that I'm communicating by being up here. Um, I'm not collaborating with everyone about this. Um, maybe we could, and maybe we should be doing it that way. Um, but I feel like this more applies to the project work, hopefully. Um, yeah. Uh, thanks, Michael. Um, when or how or will you share the results? Um, That's my first question. And then the second question is, is like how did Gov Zero kind of respond? Like, do they do they have like did this framework break from how they were thinking about themselves, assuming they were thinking about themselves, or like, yeah, I'm just curious if they have um, if they were surprised by or yeah. There was a lot. Uh, yes, Gov Gov Zero is a civic tech community or in Taiwan that is is in many ways similar this one where they value transparency and open project work and they, they kind of get together to uh, to work on things. They have values of inclusion, um, of serving other communities, not just themselves. Um, yeah, and uh, so I think it was that, I don't, I don't think it gave, they were, they were supportive I think it didn't tell them anything about whether they were like doing anything right or wrong. It was just a way, a lens to look at things, to maybe know. I think sometimes in these spaces we kind of drift through like things and we try lots, and that's. Um, I think sometimes we stumble on the right things, and we could just as easily kind of maybe stumble off of them again, uh, without the, without knowing where the value is coming from and why. Um, and I think maybe they were it, this validated a lot of what they were doing and what they were doing right. I hope it just kind of gave them, at its best, just gave them a way to when they move through something that's working, uh, how do they know to like really dig in and like, okay, we're sticking with this part and we'll play and tweak this other part that like, um, yeah, I don't know if that answered the question explicitly, but that's kind of what I think is what felt like the most, uh, the way I would, I would hope that it would, that they, they found value. And I felt, I think that that held through during conversations that we had and, uh, during my participation. Yeah, just quickly, I bet like they must get asked a lot about like what are you doing right or what are you so I'd imagine it would be helpful for them to have some frameworks for sharing. Yeah. Part one was when would you share the results? Oh, oh right. <laughs> yeah, it's like I, I, I actually was gonna put together a form, but I think I need to do the final. I need to make sure Community is interesting because some people wouldn't talk to me unless I was totally transparent and like publish their like what their interview right away. That's like one side of the community. Whereas in some people had things to say that I wanted to. I, I guess I wanted to. Consent was a big part of my interview, so I, I haven't uh, I haven't gotten the final thumbs up. Um, but user has one. Sorry. User has one. Oh, uh, well, I, I think hmm, the animating forces that, hmm. maybe the most interesting, for me the, mo the part that kind of galvanized me the most was the being curious about a community in terms of the shape of it leads to a lot of questions about, okay, what, what do you value? What, what do you think is the most, what are you part of right now here? And what have you been part of that you're really grateful for? And then when people like to cycle through that, okay, how did you get there? Who invited you? Who connected you with that opportunity? Um, and there was uh, essentially everyone who, most everyone who I interviewed kind of were pointed to a small group of people who were doing all that inviting and doing all that connecting. Um, and and it, it tended to be a, a small group of, not necessarily the leaders in the community, but a small group of um, a small group of women who were doing a lot of that connecting work and that, that kind of like relaying of like opportunities. Uh, and I found, I think, they, the community has a lot of language to reward that and recognize it, which is like wonderful and amazing. Um, but it was like just really, uh, I guess it was really, it, I, for me, it kind of like, I, I felt like it like gave me a new lens for like the importance of female leadership and that was one of the um, animating forces that I said existed in the community, is that these, yeah, these women were doing tons and tons of connecting work and thankfully the community had language for, for validating that. Um, it was just 
just, yeah, I guess I, it, I was told that was an appreciated thing to put in there and not totally repetitive. That's, yeah. That was a piece I really wanted to fit in today and I just wasn't sure how to like, I, so thanks for asking. <laughs> Thank you. Um, one of the challenges that I've identified in the Bike Space project is that collaboration has to happen across time. Uh, a good example is we may have somebody that uh, comes in with a great deal of expertise on something we really need to do, and in fairly short order, they get hired off for a job in Waterloo. That actually happened to us. And uh, it would be really great and, and essentially what we need to do is just keep, keep, the, uh, <coughs> keep the information flow going across, across time so that when people come onto the project, they have an easy way to get, uh, to get up to speed and those little bursts of information, which, as you, which, which you point out are quite important, are preserved so that essentially you can talk to somebody who's not, you can have the benefit of the experience of somebody the experience and knowledge of somebody who isn't really that, who isn't there anymore because they're working somewhere else. So I'm not exactly sure how you foster that or how, or outside formal standards, which themselves can be falsifying. But are you interested in, in thinking about that or discussing it? I'm not sure. I don't know if I have. I, it's a really great point. I'm not sure whether. I feel like in some ways getting our bodies together in a room and like allowing the like all the social intuitions we have to like to like share and talk and exchange ideas that kind of builds that resilience and we're kind of on our way to that just by doing this thing instead of just working on the internet where we like have done some practice in our leader week. Um, but I don't have too many thoughts on that side of that. That's super important. share on Slack when I like, I uh, think when I have the results, uh, when I have a shareable version of the, the final report. Um, anyhow, thanks, thanks so much. Thanks, Patrick. Um, for those of you who have announcements and or pitches, please feel